Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello again, everybody, and thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act 2. As you can see, Art Kirsch and I are with our favorite brain whisperer, Stephen Campbell. Stephen, Hi. good to see How you again. You? Hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me. It's, so, it's just such a joy to, to be with me, and I look forward to these sessions every single time we get together. So That's mutual. As do yeah. we. Yeah. You know, um, uh, speaking of getting together, one of the recent uh, episodes uh, that we shot had to do with habits. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, uh, without uh, even summarizing it uh, uh, beyond the point of we are in control and we can create new habits, mm -hmm. not get rid of the old ones. They're, they're mm -hmm. stuck there someplace. Mm -hmm. uh, but create new ones. But it, it, I was thinking that you know, um, some habits like uh, if you want to uh, 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 maybe change the time you wake up in the morning or start exercising more, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. But there are other habits that have a, uh, I'm going to call it a chemical component to it. Yeah. That yeah. you just can't overlook like uh, 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 heart uh, drugs or even smoking mm. with nicotine and other right. things where right. there's, there was alcohol. A, yeah. yeah, alcohol, yeah. where there's, where there's an additional component beyond just thinking about changing something. Class yeah. A habits. Yeah. Really, really, that's why they, they're labeled addictions. Right. Yeah, yeah that's the, the, the umbrella that sort of yeah. so what, serves. Yeah. So what's what's an addiction and why is it so challenging? Yeah, so well, what first of all, let's, okay. let's, 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 let's define it, okay? And I'll say it really slowly so we get it. A person with an addiction uses a substance, cigarettes, alcohol, drugs, and then he engages in a behavior for which the rewarding, smoking a cigarette, high on drugs, provides such an incentive that he repeats it. Ah. Even though the drug, the alcohol, the smoking, eventually could kill him. It may involve alcohol, inhalants, opioids, cocaine, nicotine, gambling. We live two miles from the largest gambling establishment in California. It's run by the Indian tribe here. And as I drive by there, it amazes me how huge it is. They even have a hotel. Well, people go in, gamble, and they sleep in the room, and they come back and gamble some more. And they lose millions. That's an addiction. So why are addictions so complicated? There's evidence that addictive behaviors are partly neurobiological. In other words, the brain's wired for drugs or alcohol, cigarettes, gambling, okay? And you have these pathways, and we talked about how the brain rewires itself. We have these pathways, and they bring pleasure. And certain people are wired in such a way that they want that pleasure no matter what happens, okay? Okay. And so they use these, these substances and they do these things that um, in all likelihood create mental health additions such as depression, anxiety, or other things that causes them to fix that by gambling some more or taking more drugs or drinking some more. Okay? So all of the addictions that we're talking about are extremely complex because they affect the award, the reward, the reinforcement, the motivation, and the memory systems of the brain. They affect all of those. Let me repeat those again. They affect the part that rewards us, that makes us feel good, reinforcement, motivation, and what do we remember? 
And the distinguishing feature of addictions is that individuals continue to pursue the activity despite the fact that they are doing themselves harm. When I began doing this 12 years ago, I did a lot of my work for DAC, the Drug Abuse Alternative Center for the County of Sonoma. And every Thursday evening, I would go in and set up my screen and I would do my presentations to these addicts. And what amazed me was that you would never know that they were addicted. It almost looked like a fraternity party. Good-looking men, good-looking women who had just basically ruined their lives. The women had lost their children. The men had lost their families. They didn't want to, but they did. So what's the key to this? Let me tell you about Rick. I met Rick when I was giving my presentation and I was doing a specific presentation on learned optimism. And Rick came up to me and I need to describe to you what he looked like. He was probably about six foot three. I'm six foot, he was six foot three. He was three inches taller than I am. Total muscle, tattoos everywhere, including all over his face, jewelry. And when he came up to me after one this presentation, he was really angry. He was shaking. He was so angry. And he said, Mr. Campbell, I am so angry at you. And that's not the word he used, but I won't tell you how he said it because we'd have to take me off the air. He said to me, I am really angry. And I said, why are you angry, Rick? And he said, because all of this is baloney. He didn't use the word baloney, just use your imagination. He said, none of this will work for me. I have been through these programs over and over and over, and they do not work. First of all, I'm dyslexic. I can't read. Second of all, I was raised in a drug culture where I was abused, and he described some of the ways he was abused, which were just beyond horrible. And he looked at me very seriously with little tears in eyes, and he said, Mr. Campbell, you are looking at a damaged man and none of this will work and i said rick let me show you a slide and i brought up a powerpoint slide that i had and on the slide simply were names whoopi goldberg tom cruise jay leno alexander graham bell Leonardo da Vinci was dyslexic. Did you know that? He was dyslexic. And I said to him, all of these people here, all these people had the same challenges that you did, Rick. But you know what they said? They said, even though I'm different, and even though it's harder, and even though I have to make it my own way, I can still do this. I can still do that. I can still do this. And then I looked up at Rick and I said, Rick, when you say this program will not work, you're absolutely correct. But the reason is because that is what you are saying. And Rick got teary eyed. And I saw his shoulders kind of. And he looked at me and he said, you mean it's really up to me? And I said, Rick, it really is. It's really up to what you decide. And I saw him three months later. He finished the program, God bless him, and he got out of it and he got a job at Safeway, at the local Safeway here in Roner Park, where I shopped. And one day I was shopping for food and came out and he came bursting out of the doors. Now remember, Rick was probably 320 pounds all muscle, running to me. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, my God, he's found me. He's going to kill me. And he did. He picked me up, put me down, gave me a big hug, and he said, Mr. Campbell, I can't tell you what happened. I said, well, tell me, tell me, tell me. 
He said, well, I didn't tell you this part when I was talking to you because I was so angry, but I love numbers. I love numbers, and I'm really good at Excel, you know, the columns and the rows and all this sort of stuff. And so I got hired at Safeway here at the midnight shift to help them with their fruits and vegetables. And I saw them throwing all this stuff out. To me, it was tragic because I've seen this in my own life, food being wasted. So I developed a worksheet for them. That helped them and that cut their the, the produce that they were throwing out by some huge amount. And they love it so much they're thinking of automating it, using it at that store. If that works, they might use it at all the safe ways. But it started with my realizing that my addiction starts with me. And I need to replace what I'm saying to myself. So let's look at some myths about addiction, okay? First of all, this is really important to understand. There is not just one cause for being addicted. And that's true of cigarettes, alcohol, anything. There could be genetic problems. There could be biological factors. There could be the person vulnerable to drugs because of where he lives, who he hangs out with, what he sees. But more important is that some characteristics, such as a lack of ability to tolerate distress, can cause addiction. Because rather than being stressed, they just rather take a pill. Or smoke a cigarette. So what are the causes? Well, there's really no way to predict who will develop compulsive substance use and who won't. Because everything that contributes to that is very, very complicated. It just cannot be really, really predicted. There's psychological factors, there's biological factors, there's environmental factors, there's all sorts of things that can cause addiction. How can it be treated? Number one, it's going to take some time. It's a long-term process. It doesn't happen overnight. But it starts with up here being replaced with a new mindset and the moon mindset is I'm just free of this of smoking drinking drugs how and what do I need to do to maintain that freedom and that's where wonderful programs come in one of our programs that enable people to really be free. These programs might involve detoxification programs, medication that can reduce the use of one of those drugs, group therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, life skills training, all these things. But it starts with, it starts with, People saying to themselves, okay, I have a problem which I cannot handle alone. But now I have these programs and these ways to get out of it. But even after the program, it's a day-by-day -day say, thing saying, I am now drug-free. I'm enjoying not having to smoke. I'm enjoying being able to drive past the casino and not go in. I love the good feelings about myself. And what's so exciting about that is that when you say that, your brain says, okay. Is it really true? I don't even care. All I care is what you tell me. 
You say it, I believe it. You lock on to it, you know what I will do. I will do everything I can to make it true in your life. Wow. That's exciting. So, Steve, you can you can lie to your brain. Yes. In fact, if you want to change it, you really have to lie to your brain because right. you know it will believe whatever you tell it. But as That's Stephen right. Campbell says, That's your right. brain will believe whatever you tell it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. So take advantage of that. We take advantage of it both negatively and positively. We say to ourselves, I'm... I'm addicted. There's nothing I can do about it. And your brain says, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely true. Mm. And when you, people get to the point where they say, you know what? I may be addicted, but I can replace this right. with positive things. Is it easy? Of course it isn't. Because your brain is so wired up there for addiction. But, uh, but if, I can go back, if I can go back to my original premise and then expand it a little bit, uh, that uh, there, because we, we talked about some mixed metaphors of, of uh, addictions, mm -hmm. some of them have a chemical component that's coming from the outside. Mm -hmm. But in fact, whether it be, uh, let's take dieting, where it's not necessarily from the outside, there are certain things when you're thin or eating or thrown, that are creating some kind of chemical production mm -hmm. in your brain which I think the the addictive material such as uh, uh, drugs or uh, smoking with uh, uh, nicotine uh, mm -hmm. makes it easier to go ahead and grab that pleasure uh, a drug that our brain is producing as yes. opposed to uh, uh, so if, if you we can figure out how to get that pleasure without needing that external source that mm -hmm. may be the way that whether it be uh, uh, pseudochemical, or I forget the exact term you used, that basically being able to to tell our brain, hey, this is the way it's going to be, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to need this external help mm -hmm. to make me feel good. I'm going to feel good yeah. because I'm healthy. Yeah. I'm thin, whatever it happens yeah. to be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it has to be over and over. It doesn't have to happen just once. Right. And, these, and this gets over. into the people should go. Uh, we don't have time for now. Uh, go back to the chapter that we did months ago on affirmations, and maybe yeah, maybe we'll we'll uh, do a, uh, a maybe we can do that. that. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How to make affirmations work? Right. You know, yeah. Steve, I I really appreciate the fact that you pointed out in this episode how complicated no, uh, really is. addictions yeah. can be, and that there can be more than one. Uh, reason for it more than one maybe I mean the strongest the strongest power is a mother and her child mm. the strongest connection is a mother and her child and I worked with women who had lost their children because they would rather have methamphetamines that's how powerful meth is it's just an incredibly powerful. And for these women to knowingly take their children with them in the car as they were getting their meth, that shows you how powerful meth is. Yeah. But you've had success in helping some of them. Some of them, absolutely, yes. Overcome Not it. all of them, right. but some of them, yeah. I think that's, you know, uh, we've heard it said, um, that you you need to you know you can't you can't kick your habit unless you first admit you have it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um i and think that's, that's helpless that you're helpless yeah that you're helpless that you're that's why ahead. aa starts with god he said lord i need your help yeah i need your help yeah, yeah that all fits in perfectly with what mm -hmm. you're saying it really does it really uh, does because god created his brain for us so he knows how it works far better than we do yeah. Yeah. Well, I I feel sorry and terrible for not only those people that have an addiction of some mm -hmm. sort, mm -hmm. um, but their families, because mm -hmm. usually oh. a, a, when a bad habit reaches the level of an addiction, yeah. then it almost always affects 
the people yeah. around the addict. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. as much in different ways, of course, but yeah. just as much as it does the addict. Yeah. And, uh, we, and they suffer terribly. When when Mary was smoking, she and she we had our children. She had to go outside in the backyard, way in the corner, and a chair which we gave to her, and she would go out there and smoke. And you could see the diet cokes and the the cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. Until finally she saw her father dying of emphysema, which is one of the worst ways, because it's just say basically you're drowning, you're drowning. And she, I picked her up at SFO. She said, "You're looking at a non-smoker." Okay, yeah. but I, I do I do want to emphasize that in all the conversations we've had, uh, and while Mary's uh, uh, able to 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 uh, break her addiction, was mm -hmm. based on a traumatic personal experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are so many dozens of stories that you've told us and that we know in our personal lives that it doesn't have to be that way. No, it, you don't no. have to have something traumatic no. happen. If, no. if you learn how to uh, create a new habit. Yeah. OK, that makes much more sense to your brain. Yeah. And yeah. overpowers the, the bad habit. So uh, we, thank you for, 40... we, we thank you for giving us uh, that hope You're welcome. and uh, look forward to further discussions about how to accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Such a joy. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.